This is part of the NCSSM online CompCAN course. Okay, let's get right into it. In this course, there's going to be six guiding questions that we're going to be referring back to on a regular basis, and you're going to need to know these questions uh, to help guide your study of computational chemistry. The first question is, what is the role and purpose of computational chemistry? What does computational chemistry allow us to do that cannot be done using traditional, otherwise known as wet chemistry? Wet chemistry is probably what you've done in a laboratory with test tubes and beakers and Bunsen burners and all that kind of stuff. And what we're interested in finding out is what can CompChem do uh, that maybe is different from and or complementary to what can be done using traditional chemical techniques. Okay. The second question is, what is the fundamental mathematical expression that needs to be solved in doing computational chemistry? What are the terms in this equation? What are, what's the significance of those terms? And what variations can be used uh, in the mathematics of computational chemistry? And the next question is, what are the approximations that can be used in doing CompChem? What are the pros and cons of all these various approximations? And how does your choice of an approximation affect your results, uh, the computing time, and various other aspects of the results that you get from the computer? Okay, the next three are, uh, there are roughly four different flavors to CompChem, ab initio methods, semi-empirical methods, density functional theory, or DFT, and molecular mechanics, molecular dynamics. And what are these methods and how do they differ from each other? How does the computational chemist make decisions about which one of these uh, different approaches to take to solving a chemical problem? Okay. The fifth one is pretty simple. What are the fundamental units of measure used by computational chemists? What are some different ways that these fundamental units might be expressed? We don't use quite the same nomenclature in terms of units. For example, in energy, we use, uh, most chemists use kilojoules per mole or kilocalories per mole. We use a unit of energy uh, measure known as the heart tree, and we'll talk about that as uh, we, we move along. And the last, the sixth question is, what are some of the computer codes that one might use to do computational chemistry? What platforms are needed for these codes, meaning what kind of computer hardware do you need to do these codes? And what are the strengths and limitations of these codes? So these are the six questions that we're going to be referring back to on a regular basis. All right, let's talk a little bit about the purpose of computational chemistry. And we can define computational chemistry as, if I can get my slides to pop up here, that branch of chemistry that uses computers to generate information that is complementary to experimental data on the structures, properties, and reactions of substances. So notice in there, by the way, we're using the words complementary to experimental data. We don't do necessarily do computational chemistry instead of doing experimental work. Uh, they are both computational work and experimental work are all tools that chemists use to learn stuff about uh, molecules and chemical systems. Uh, the mathematics is mostly based on one algorithm, the Schrodinger equation, and we'll spend a fair amount of time in the mathematics section talking about the mathematics of this equation. Uh, and as a side note, uh, historically computational chemistry has required the use of high performance systems, meaning supercomputers. It's only been in fairly recent numbers of years, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, that we've been able to do computational chemistry on a desktop or laptop computer. So that's a, we've seen a lot of changes in a very short period of time. Why do we do computational chemistry? This is a great quote from P.A.M. Dirac in 1929. And he said, the underlying physical law is necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. Keep in mind, this is in 1929. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations that are much too complicated to be soluble. And what he meant to say there was solvable. Uh, and the, the significance of this quote is in 1929, what did we not have? We did not have computers in 1929. And the mathematics were so difficult, you just simply couldn't solve them using paper and pencil. So we knew all of the math that we needed to know to understand everything we need to understand in chemistry. We just couldn't solve the problems. Well, fast forward to the year 2009, 2010, and 
we now have computers that can do a lot of the difficult mathematical work for us uh, that is pretty hard to do with paper and pencil. Okay, let's talk a little bit about computational chemistry procedure. And roughly there are three things that I want to know. Um, I want to know, and I refer to this as SPA, I want to know the structure. What does the molecule look like? Okay, what are the atoms in there? What are the bond lengths? What are the bond angles? What's the bond symmetry? What properties does the molecule have? What characteristics does the molecule have by itself? Uh, it has molecular energy. It has a dipole moment. It has structure. Uh, and one of these things that we use for this is known as, excuse me, my slides went off on me here, um, is what's known as quantitative structure property relationships, and that's one of the techniques that I can use. Let me get down here to that. There we go. Okay, so um, quantitative structure property relationships, quantitative, of course, meaning calculated or numerical. So what this says is if I can calculate, if I know the structure of a molecule, I can calculate some of the properties of the molecule. Uh, likewise, activity is how does the molecule behave in the presence of other molecules. And here are some of the things that I can calculate, uh, electrostatic potential, frontier orbitals, HOMO and LUMO. And here's a chart of that uh, that I'm trying to show. And what we're showing here is this is a roadmap of the social sciences. So what you see here is social sciences is primarily the study of people uh, who exhibit specific characteristics, and those characteristics are structure, property, and activity. Structure is what the person looks like. Properties is the basic characteristics of a person. You can see some descriptors down here below. And activity is describes how this person interacts with other people. They're humorous, they're shy, they're witty, they're generous, whatever the case, case may be. So this might be a roadmap if I were a social scientist and I were trying to learn stuff about people. I need to know a little bit about what their body type is, hair color, height. I need to know their basic char property characteristics. And I need to know how they interact with other people. Okay. If I go to a roadmap of chemistry, uh, you should notice that this map looks exactly the same as the roadmap for people. Okay, chemistry is not the study of people, it's the study of molecules, and molecules exhibit specific characteristics, and those characteristics are structure, property, and activity. Okay? Structure meaning what the molecule looks like, bonds, number of atoms, the bond types, uh, the properties are some basic characteristics of the molecule, total energy, vibrational frequencies, something called enthalpy that you might have run across before, and Molecules have an activity which describes how they interact with other molecules. They have an electrostatic potential. They have an electron affinity. They have a nucleophilicity. So these are all things in doing computational chemistry. What we want to be able to do is use comp chem to help us understand something about the structure of molecules. Use comp chem to help us understand some of the properties of molecules. And use comp chem to help us understand the activity or how these molecules behave with other molecules. Okay, so that's a little bit of your roadmap of how we get there. All right, let, let's talk a little bit about what I call the computational cooking process, and this is sort of a silly analogy. And uh, some considerations are the starting shape of the molecule. Okay, well, let's assume that we're talking about chicken. So the starting shape is what does the thing look like? What's the shape of the chicken? It has legs, a breast, a wing, a strips. In molecules, we want to know what's the geometry of the molecule, the atoms, the bonds, the angles, and bond lengths. Um, I also need to know the final product. What do I want at the end? If I'm cooking chicken, I need to know I want fried chicken, I want baked chicken, I want barbecue, I want stir fry, whatever the case may be. In chemistry, um, uh, the final product is what properties do I want to know? Energies, vibrations, thermodynamics, transition state. I need to know what are my available tools, what tools do I have to work with in cooking. Um, I would say I have a microwave, a stove, an oven, a grill, an open fire. And depending on what tools I have, that decides what I'm able to do. And Comp Chem, the, the tools are the software that I have, Gaussian Games, Mopac, Tinker, whatever the case may be. Uh, in cooking, I need to know what methods do I have or know, what are my instructions. In cooking, obviously, that's known as a recipe. Okay, so what recipes do I know? In computational chemistry, we don't call them recipes, we call them methods. And methods are ab initio, semi-empirical, molecular mechanics, DFT, etc. And lastly is resources. What resources do I have at my disposal in cooking? 
I would say those resources are the ingredients, the sauces, the spices, whatever the case may be, okay, and computational chemistry cooking. Uh, mostly the resources are what's known as a basis set, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about basis sets. All right, if you have any questions, we'll hope to have them in the video conference, and we'll see you online soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.